Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by 3% and Open Letter, in which we take one giant book, break it down bit by bit, section by section, talk about it, analyze it, have fun, make jokes. This season, this is the, the last episode of the 10th season, which has been covering Duck's Newburyport by Lucy Ellman, the amazingly, incredibly dense, incredibly rich, incredibly rewarding book that is over a thousand pages long that we've been reading for like three plus months. I'm Chad Post from Open Letter, and I'm joined as always by Brian Wood of Joytime Killbox, author of Joytime Killbox. Hi. It'd be funny if you were from Joytime Killbox. <laughs> yeah. How are you? Pretty good. How was your How are your holidays? Oh yeah. Hey, I haven't seen you in a decade. <laughs> no way. A decade ends at the end of the twenty. No. Let's just get the dad jokes out of the way. Let's do it. <laughs> That's good. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Just back from a, a long vacation and well, vacation in Canada with the family. So, oh, cool. Glad we rescheduled this for now because it was not conducive to. So you you not. only take vac you only take vacations where they have legal weed. I think <laughs> Can Canada, Hawaii, <laughs> Massachusetts, Michigan, <laughs> Illinois just joined the list too. I just Illinois. Saw it. Uh, Illinois. Illinois. There's something going on now. Have you noticed with um, reading this book, um, anytime I see a news, read a news headline or see the news, I, I, I filter it through <laughs> Ducks Newburyport and the voice of the, <laughs> the voice of the narrator. Oh yeah. It keeps like it's impregnated itself into my brain in that way. Oh, I get it. I, I totally get it. Is there a news that you're thinking of? Yeah. Um, it just came around new year's um, with uh, President Trump and Melania, where she misspoke saying like she wanted peace on earth, and like people just tore her up on Twitter because she said it wrong, or like, all right, whatever. English is like her ninth language, whatever. So she messed it up. Um, but then Trump like cuts her off and tells her to be quiet, <laughs> and, like, you're not supposed to share your New Year's resolutions or you'll jinx them. And then, like, a day later, they bomb and kill a uh, kill the uh, general from everyone's like Shh, hey i'm about to start a war so let's not yeah let's <laughs> can you just can you just shut up with this peace talk please we're like, <laughs> but I, I was like filtering all of this like what what would the the fact that like what would be the paragraph rant on that with oh with, yeah like with, with melania and the look and being quieted by trump again and it was just like oh man this is like text newberry port all over again <laughs> That's, but yeah, yeah I, I keep filtering everything through this. Like I can't escape it. It's, it's a it's a book that's kind of taken over my life for a little bit here as we've carried it around with us. That was the thing that I mentioned like when I finished reading this before I went on away to, to Canada. Um, I had mentioned to you that I thought we should talk about solipsism at some point. It was kind of related to that, that we're, mm -hmm. we had Elizabeth on last episode and she was talking about like the representation of Stacy and how she isn't a fold out character. I was thinking about how in like a Nabokovian way, this book is like only contained within the singular consciousness and is incapable of going into anyone else's consciousness. And it, and because it's so sealed that way, I think as you're reading it, it becomes, you become part of it. Like it's a much more of a book that makes you adjust to its consciousness rather than being separate from, you have to be inside of it and sort of it, it inhabits your brain as well. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I could, I can definitely see it that way. I mean, I can always, can you, you can almost imagine this book, well, not this book, but you can almost imagine a series of books where, like, what if we did one where it was Stacy's point of view? Yeah. How, I, how I the would, voice would be. Did, Newberry Park Universe. Yeah. And then you could do one from Ronnie's. Like, let's do a MAGA one. Like, with cool. those, those are the facts that would just be bonkers, right? Can you imagine getting into that headspace for a little while? Or, so have you, this is off topic, but yeah, because there's um that, so I've been watching Watchmen now. I'm finally caught up and I'm, I'm on like oh. episode five. So I haven't seen all of them, but they have all this ex external, like additional matter, uh, matter online on HBO. That's part of like, Oh the yeah. Film. The Dewey, yeah. Deweypedia or whatever. Yeah. PDpedia. And, um, Oh yeah. Dewey. <laughs> I like Dewey better than Pedia. Dewey. whatever. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> ridiculous. Dewey, PD, it's the same, uh, slight build person. But they have like as one of the yeah exactly <clears throat> they have one of the one of the things that's in there is an article from the New Frontiersman the right wing crazy paper that's like complaining about a Supreme Court justice and then it's like what we all need to do is 
we need to go to Mars. All the white people need to just go to Mars. Let's, let's, let's go colonize Mars and make that our planet. It already has Dr. Manhattan who's blue and the surface is red and now all it needs is us white. <laughs> I was like, that would be Ronnie's thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great lot that's wonderful logic that follows perfectly well. <laughs> <laughs> the, the news the new subline that came up that that reminded me of this is the one that i sent you last night of a uh, dr phil notorious mom hater selling his holy house, cow is loaded with guns loaded with guns on a wall a wall display of weaponry that guy is fucked up i hate him his dining room, when I was looking through the pictures of Dr. Phil's house, his dining room looked like it was probably a rejected concept art from the Beetlejuice movie. It, supposedly Tim Burton was the big influence on the whole thing. Okay, because it was like, I saw this table in Beetlejuice, you know, when the shrimp cocktail grabs him by the face. and <laughs> like, like, <laughs> Except it's a little more wild than that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who wants to live there or eat there is what I want. Like, uh, that, that guy's not okay. Not okay. Yeah. But I know so what was your feel? What was your feeling about? Well, Ken, why don't you do your um, spiel that you normally do, where you recap, summarize, summarize what happened. What was the recap? Yeah, so this is the first time I'm going to do this, but spoilers, guys. Like, if you've not read, the oh, screw spoilers. spoilers! If you're if you're this far, come on, it's the last episode at yeah. this point. Come on. If you haven't read it though, and you're one of those people that just lets and you nah. read, and you are curious about reading it, like all, a lot of things are backloaded here. So um, when we left. Uh, there, I don't know what was happening when we left, but the main thing in here is that the the mountain lion has been caught. We knew that. Um, we find out that in this section that Jim was the dog that was accompanying accompanying the mountain lion and is now living with the deer tracker, which everyone knows and the whole family knows. But then the big thing is they're all making cookies. They're making uh, uh, mountain lion cookies, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ronnie comes into the house. Like he comes to the house first and she turns him away. Then he comes into the house and threatens them with a gun. Um, says a lot of nasty things about the narrator and about her being a prick tease and leading him on and all sorts of things and holds them all kind of hostage. Um, shoots like the kitchen timer, shoots up the refrigerator. Um, That's the meanest part. How dare you shoot a refrigerator? You know what it costs to replace one of those? That seems like I'm insane. Yeah, that should be what a jerk. I think that and especially with I don't how know. much she uses that, like when they talk about what's in the freezer, yeah. she has more stuff in her freezer than I have in my house. Like, this is an important item here. Get one of the kids. Get one of the kids before you hit the refrigerator. Good lord! All right, so Ronnie, Ronnie comes in. He's shooting everything up. It's terrifying. But it's told in a really flat. It's the same. Like the tone doesn't change at that scene, which was interesting. Yeah, and it's told from the from the future or for like looking back. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are, like the tension of it is there, but like it's also it's also you know that she's not going to get shot. I didn't find it with. I didn't find much tension in that part. Yeah. I mean, there, because yeah, of really because of the different. part of speech and just the the style the style still being that kind of it was strangely kind of humorous. I mean, like they tie him up with shirts. They you know, like I saw a self defense book and I choked him out. Or you know, like there's kind of something just sort of like wacky and bizarre. It reminds me of like Lolita when he shoots the when um Humbert Humbert tra you know tracks down and shoots him. Like how funny that scene yeah. is. I mean, it's not funny, but it's. I wasn't like it was. It's not tense and terrifying in the way that scene normally would be written. Right. Yeah. If that makes sense. I totally agree. And so Stacy clobbers him with a yeah. ramp, and then jumps him. They kick the gun away. They tie him up, and like. Well, they beat they beat him with flour and apples. Yeah, exactly. Right? How, how are we supposed to read this scene? He gets beat with a sack of flour and then pelted with apples. <laughs> the mom, the mom wins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, All right, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Continue. Oh no, no, no. I don't. And and then they they run away, and there is like a sense of trauma to it all. Like there's more of a sense yeah. of trauma than there is a sense of like palpable like uh, action movie fear. So there isn't like the action movie fear that that you'd expect in like a different sort of book or in like a Jack Ryan movie or something. But like there is <laughs> that sense of like I wasn't sure if maybe someone was going to get shot. Like maybe Stacy was going to get shot at some point. Yeah. So, like, something bad could happen to someone other than the narrator. Um, but instead, like there are, there is like a moment of heroism. Um, but it also, it's, it's interesting because it does bring together a lot of the different threads about the guns, about men, about uh, there's even mm -hmm. the bit afterwards where they're like, the NRA came up with a statement against them saying if they had a, if they had guns in their house, they would have been fine. <laughs> and they're like, and they want to do a statement back, retaliatory statement. They're like, no, don't do that. Cause you'll get death threats. <laughs> and they're like, okay, cool. <laughs> 
<laughs> no more. That's thank you very much. Um, and like there's like, yeah, it's like Stacy's redemption in some sense and her moment of like of overall, you know, I don't know, being being the the hero, heroine. And and it kind of oddly in a way serves as a it's like a device to give her kind of the fame or the meaning that she desires in her life. Yeah. Like the way they watch morning routine videos or, you know, you can't help but feel small or, or kind of like meaningless. And then it, it provides her fame in a way like she becomes famous from it. And yeah, so it does, it does neatly tie up a lot of the, a lot of the threads very, very, uh, very quickly and succinctly with that scene. Yeah, although it does end with the like, uh, the fact that I hope all her rebelliousness hasn't been completely quelled by trauma. And that yeah. back new role as our savior, big responsibility. <laughs> there's like, there's that, that sense of like, yeah, that she, the fame and the like, having been that, like she hopes that doesn't change her, her essential like rebellious spirit still. Yeah. So then as far as um, the way we read Ducks, is it fair to look at the to draw a parallel with the lioness finding her cubs with the the narrative that takes place, like juxtaposed on either side of it? Yeah, so here's my thought. Because I feel like at the, towards the end, it's very, I think it's there's nothing wrong with linking those two things together with being reunited with the, right, with the mom being reunited with the cubs, for instance. Yeah. And it's almost, it's almost like your, your longingness to be with your kids was kind of, almost a hollow gesture because it's like the, the cubs ended up not needing you. Right. Right. But like it brought so much, like you feel, you feel for the lioness when she's finally reunited with them and just wants to like lick them and clean them and be with them. Like it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but it's like, they, they would have been okay. And then when, when Ronnie shows up, um, it's Stacy that saves the day and it's the mom that's frozen and like, so they would have been all right without you. Like that kind of, I, that there's that parallel there, right? We're both in confined spaces uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> with the, with the kids surrounding them. Like it is, mm -hmm. there's a lot of like, that parallel is the same thing I was thinking too. And that they're both still like, they're both like bound by certain structures, either uh, social or like actually a cage. Um, but the yeah. kids, that they can like love their kids, but loving your kids is also letting them be different, be separate. Do you think that's a um, that's a common theme for parenting throughout like different generations? Like you're always like, I find myself as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm looking down at the younger generation, like, oh boy, they're they're screwed. Like, <laughs> like the the world is going to hell. Like you you guys have no chance. And it's like, well, I'm sure <laughs> my parents said the same thing about me, and their parents said the same thing about you know yeah, Elvis them. At the start of it all. Yeah, with their reefer, with their reefer dope and their marijuana cigarettes, like they're all gonna, you know, the country's gonna be awful. And then now, I mean, I mean the, thing, the thing that's not wrong about it is that like every generation seems to have it a little bit worse than the last one. Sure, <laughs> like, sure, sure. Like maybe it's not that maybe it's not that they're that they're totally screwed, but like, well, we made a lot of mistakes, and mm, <laughs> good luck. For, yeah, I just remember growing up like there. Oh, there's some. I don't know. Apparently, my parents ruined something called the ozone layer. I don't know if we need it or not, but I don't know. That and the rainforest are going to be gone. And yeah, the rainforest <laughs> the ozone layer because of hairspray. Yeah. Um, and now it's just the whole world's on fire. The whole world is <laughs> really on fire right now. <laughs> yeah, all over the place. California, Australia, every, yeah, and everything in between. <laughs> we are pretty, we are pretty so maybe it, is, maybe it is fair to be super concerned. But yeah, but, but do you find yourself having, hey, hey, Alex, your future's gone. <laughs> sorry about it. Hey, little buddy, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't. I don't drink from styrofoam anymore, though. Save the turtle, man. That. Don't use those. Don't use the straws. Yeah, there's 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 that that sense of worry and that like I do think that that's been passed down through all the generations. Like what you're saying, that people have to, yeah like, uh, be concerned about like the future for their kids and like then the kids are somehow they figure things out and there's yeah. like that bit of hopefulness with like the environment stuff that like the next generation might have some grand thing that we don't know that we can't know that we can't do scientific or otherwise that they're capable of doing that will will rectify things enough mm -hmm. they could be believing that might i to add to this 
my daughter is about to turn 16. Wait. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what it's like. yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is which is like that now writ large. Like she's so a couple like, years away from like he, voting and being moving out on her own. Yeah, no, I mean, there's like uh, the vehicular manslaughter concerns. There's the oh, you can just like you have a private hotel room you can drive around in pretty soon. Great, <laughs> like just like beyond like everything you could ever be terrified about. Like oh, great, yeah, this, I'm. <laughs> I'm gonna be facing that head on here in about a month. Great. In about two days. <laughs> two days. Two days. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Oh very, dear. Very awesome. Wait. Yeah, that is terrifying. Good yeah, Lord. that's the one that like it hits it. We had the 16th birthday party for with my my family, and I was like, oh my god. Like I didn't think that was really happening, and now I'm like, 16 is a lot of years. It's a lot of years. And 18 is gonna be super fast, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I guess by twenty one, you can just let them go, right? Yeah, don't worry, <laughs> man. They're, they're like they're on their own at that point. Right? So it's only a couple of years to be. Yeah, <laughs> to worry, be worried. Worried about fuck it. Like they're off at college, they'll be okay. Um, yeah. So I don't know. There was a really funny joke online, by the way, about this, where uh, I said that announced that we were doing this um, this podcast today, the final one. And uh, this one guy, Declan O'Driscoll, tweeted something to the effect of like, I bet you guys are really shocked when uh, when the narrator went and bought a gun and went and assassinated the lioness. <laughs> <laughs> I have to save my dog and my family. <laughs> <laughs> family first. And slaughter, slaughters the lioness. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, it's interesting because this is the first time that like there is a section that like really this is like a plotted thing at this point. Like, yeah. And I don't know that focusing on the plot even makes a lot of sense. because It is much more about like her consciousness and representation of the world and of the way of thinking, like we were talking about at the beginning. That's really the main thrust of the book. And like the the actual like center events are are there to illustrate that, but they're not. They're they. I don't I don't know that they're like the main thrust of the book, even though it does all kind of coalesce in that way. It seems more like a structure to make the narrative fall into place rather than it's the point of the book. Yeah. Were you satisfied with it going that more? Um, I don't know what the right term would be, but just kind of, you know, more, I don't know, like Hollywood's not the right word, but it kind of like it, it gives you like this, like, oh, here's a climax, you know, like the, the conventional. Yeah, I think so. Because I think that there's like, I think that if I were, were to reread this, like, I think there's a pacing thing going on with it. That that mm -hmm. like some of what we we're talking about of like how it it does sort of speed up or like the stories become longer. I think there's something really intricate with that that's impossible to see even as we were reading it here. And I think that that last little spot, like the last singular in the kitchen, this scene, they're all trapped in there. Mm -hmm. That that is a culmination of a lot of like things that are happening with the storytelling and not just the the things that she's talking about. So like all the the themes of Ronnie and the guns and Stacy and like all that. Yeah, sure. That all weaves together here but i think that there's something with like the pacing of it to get it to this one singular spot moment that that made it work for me the part that i was more confused by was the, the appendix like i wasn't yeah. sure what to make of the appendix exactly yeah i don't know if, if it needs to be there or not um it just says a roundup of abbreviations what sanitized for your comfort yeah, that part is kind of fun. <laughs> and reading through that is pretty fun because they're like a lot sure, of sure. It, it gives like a post. Real. It gives like a postmodern feel, right? It feels like something that'd be in uh, like a '80s, '90s postmodern, like American literature sort of thing, where they want to footnote things or have like jokes in the back or you know play the playfulness. Yeah, but there's like there's like a um. So this part, yeah. So there's like whatever POTUS, purveyor of totally unprecedented sleaze. And like, there's like jokes that are within it that are fun. And that like sort of, it's a mm -hmm. convention of her, of the, the consciousness of the narrator in terms of like all those things that she's saying, she's not using them the way that we use them always. Sometimes she is and sometimes yeah. not. And like she's, sanit they're sanitized because she doesn't swear and she doesn't say that stuff like that. Um, but also it's like, it, it makes it a little bit joyful. But right after that, the appendix part is the part that I'm not certain, which just quotes from other people. It's the first time that there's like a separate, voices in this book and they're like oh yeah sorry sorry yeah 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 and i'm not i'm not certain what to make of this part like i guess it just like sort of hits upon like 
all the different themes that are in the book, almost like a series of epigraphs as an appendix instead. The, the one, yeah. the one that I marked was the Silas Soul one. That's about um, the slaughter of the Indians. Yes, seemed like the most like horrific. I tell you, Ned, it was hard to see little children on their knees have their brains beat out by men professing to be civilized. One squaw was wounded and a fellow took a hatchet to finish her. She held her arms up to defend her and he cut one arm off and held the other with one hand and dashed the hatchet through her brain. Like, I wonder, and some some of these, like, uh, they're like, get ready, get ready, the world is coming to an end from James Thurber. Like, they all sort of relate to the book that we just read, almost like giving it like a, a grounding, like a real world grounding, mm -hmm. I guess. But like, it is so real. Like, I don't know. I, just, I wasn't sure what to make of those those quotes at the end exactly like how to incorporate them into yeah, yeah, yeah. The feeling of the book but i didn't dislike them they were just like they're they're there they're fine yeah um it reminds me too because there's there's the talk and i was wondering if it's ever gonna have any sort of payoff but there's this this idea of like within the setting of the of the mounds like the snake the serpent mounds the alligator mound the which I think are like burials. Like They're, Indian burials. So like I looked this up before. I can't remember his burials, but they were definitely set up for um ast astro astronomical things as well. Oh, the equinox and the yeah. for the yeah. So there's there's something there with that. And you know, obviously there's the the tracker could be anything. He was half Cherokee. Right. Right. So yeah, another thing you could and even at the very last page, right? The fact that we're going to let Jillian do the Indian mud run too. Right. So there's something with Native Americans. Um, oh yeah. Like and, their, and their displacement by, you know, your European patriarchy coming through and <laughs> it's blood, death and torture that everything is built upon. And that's what everything is built upon and then what it, what it does to her, what it does to her family, what it, you know. Would you say that it's optimistic at the end? I don't, I think it, <clears throat> I think it's perfectly balanced where it is and it isn't. So there's an optimistic sense yeah. of like that Stacy will be all right. And that if that's one of the things like, they're yeah. going to be all right. And that and that there's she's, she's brave, she's strong, she can handle adversity. Like would would the future be better in her hands? Right. Yes. Right. Right. And that, that maybe that's like a there's like a symbolic nature to her beating up Ronnie to give like, oh well the, the optimism for the future is that maybe people like Stacy will be they won't be trapped in this kitchen <clears throat> or under these like patriarchal strictures, that they will they will be forceful. Like she can't, she can't, uh, the narrator doesn't react or doesn't know what to do. And Stacy does know how to act and like can save them there. That yeah. there is like there that the, the, the way that things have been constructed in society for so long for, for seemingly ever um, are shifting and that there's also yeah. a sense of optimism. It, I, I, uh, okay. I'm going to say it, but I'm not sure I'm right. I'm saying this out loud as I'm thinking it. So <clears throat> there's a sense of optimism to me in the sense that if you read this it's impossible it, it feels impossible to agree with the other side and that that that's sort mm -hmm. of a mind changing like if there's an aspect to literature that can help adjust people's consciousness or way of thinking about things if that's if that's true this book makes a very strong case against like everyone having weapons against patriarchal norms against all this stuff where mm -hmm. you can't imagine if you read this all then being like pro maga in like a hyper fucked up way that a lot of people are um yeah and so in a way i think that that's optimistic that the it, it, this is tying it into too many things maybe but it's optimistic that this book got the attention it got because that's helping spread this particular viewpoint unless that viewpoint is only being read by people who already embody it's, it's preaching i think it's preaching to the choir it probably is but there's the the i don't can you imagine any like hardcore Fox, any kind of like hardcore Fox News, like I mean, super right wing person picking up this book and no, reading it? Not those people, but like the people. 
They're gonna read God's guns, grits, gravy, whatever that, that whatever the G book is. <laughs> oh, it's got co it, that one's got cooking in it too, grits and gravy, right? right? But like not the people, so not the extreme end, but like people in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People in the people in Ohio or Illinois or Michigan that are like conflicted. Is there any? Is there anybody in the middle anymore? I don't. Know. I think. I think there. I hope. Like you, you, you either want to put kids in cages or you want a green new deal. Like it's one or the other. Like you can't. <laughs> you can't do. There's nothing in between. Would, would it not be better <laughs> if we were two separate countries? <laughs> sure. Yeah. With a. But who's going to build the wall between us? <laughs> yeah. Because <exactly. laughs> I don't want my country to pay for it. They would. Yeah, they want to. We'll yeah. Give them Ohio. Yeah. We'll give them Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah I, one of my favorite lines in this little bit was that there's no michelin star restaurant in the flyover states so i was trying to find if there's a michelin star restaurant in rochester and there's not <laughs> oh there's nothing close to a michelin star restaurant here <laughs> <Yeah>. nope <laughs> how many michelin star but, i don't know what the, the but we but we have garbage plates yeah we do yeah we do um the, the highest they do is three but like what is what what yeah where are Where's a close one? Uh, New York City has a few. Yeah. How many are there? Obviously. Uh, I don't know. Chicago has a few. New York City has a few. Um, Napa has a couple. Los Gatos, California, San Francisco might have one. But, like, I don't know. Like, they're, they're, it's, like, silly to get them. You have to have, like, there's a certain number of things you have to, like, check off of a list. You have to have a really good wine list. The service has to be impeccable. The food has to be impeccable. And. It has to be sustained and whatever. The, thing, the closest I could find was that the guy that opened up um, where Two Vine used to be, the restaurant in town that's opened up as Reds or has opened up as Reds, that he worked a Michelin star restaurant before moving uh -huh. there. So, like, theoretically. Yeah, I, I went there for brunch. It's pretty good. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's nice. I've not been there. But yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's this weird, like, pursuit of madness. It doesn't. I don't know. I guess it means something if you're into that, but whatever. But otherwise, yeah, no, doesn't matter at all. You can be, you can be, you can have really good food without any Michelin stars. So. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Like, I think, I think you can't have three Michelin stars if you have um, paper towels in your bathroom, for instance. Like, it has to be cloth. No, like for real. Like, yeah. it ha like there's like certain standards that it's the same thing with like a hotel. They get five a five diamond hotel. It has to have like. A uh, twenty-four hour room service with a menu. Like if you don't do that, you're four diamond. Like there's certain little things you have to pay for and provide to be top notch. And why 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 would you provide that in uh, Kansas? Yeah, <laughs> no, just go to Applebee's. Just go to Applebee's and be happy. Get, get out of here. <laughs> the, the line around that is the fact that a lot of that lots of restaurants don't even want a Michelin star because it attracts the wrong kind of customers. Customers who want pre desserts, whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah did, did you like the line where uh she totally shit on ohio which one oh good lord where was it um it talks about like the people that fr are from ohio and <laughs> winesburg ohio and she just takes a total giant dump on ohio and i was like oh, oh man chad's gonna love it as a marked it, but it's as a michigander which is a word i don't like but as a michigander i thought you'd like that oh yeah but I don't remember where it was. I remember I'll, I'll find it in a moment. Yeah, there's the one of the lines I did like too is um. Or oh, here he goes. Uh, nine nine twenty two. Oh. Okay. Um, the fact that I'd better get dressed. The fact that Ohioans are such pushovers for any mention of Ohio or anyone who comes from Ohio, Winesburg, Ohio, Wiseacre, Widows, Little Pucker. <laughs> but she goes on about <laughs> Ohio's being pushovers, and <laughs> I wish I was. I wish I wasn't from Ohio, and yes. I'm from Illinois or Connecticut, but I'm definitely not from Ohio. When, yeah, yeah, Ohio really is awful. So I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> You're making making friends. No, but who's really listening to us from Ohio? Do you think? <laughs> what are our records for Ohio? Probably low. You know, it's, this is this is also that that sort of book where everything pops up over and over again. So um, yeah, and like then enters into your real life in a better better Meinhof sort of way. But um, the we were at a restaurant and they had a brewery in Sarnia, Ontario, which is where I was, um, which is essentially Ohio. Uh, and there was a trivia pursuit game from like, you know, years ago. 
and I was flipping through and asking questions while we were waiting for our food. And one of them was, which, what, who uh, would sign steak knives, Love Hurts, when they did a, a comeback tour um, in whatever year it was? I can't remember. Love Hurts. Nope, it's Bob. Yeah. Because he... <laughs> oh, And Bob okay. brings it up immediately on page 937. Yeah. And isn't there a movie that's out right now, like on Netflix or something? Or Probably. Mm -hmm. So everything, everything in this book just comes up over and over again in real life too. Well, if you if you have you know, however many four hundred thousand words or whatever this is, like yeah, something better pop up. Come on, yeah, good odds, yeah, good odds. Nevertheless, it's just yeah. those things that like it doesn't. The timing works out too closely sometimes. Yeah, like it feels like like I'd read it and then the next, you know, two minutes later, <laughs> that thing would pop up. It wasn't like oh yeah, just, well yeah, I mean. It, Obviously, like it, with it being so prescient too, with you know the 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 comments she makes about how like miserable Melania is being married to Trump and the being thrown into the spotlight with with politics, and then just recently it just happened again, just two days ago. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just a moment. <laughs> it's really wild. It's really wild. Yeah, I I don't know. So I don't know if there's anything more about this specific. Section. Oh yeah, I circled and started sciatica because I, I read that part when I pulled the my back and couldn't move my left leg because of my sciatic nerve for a day. So I was like, "Yep, there's sciatica right there." Thanks, perfect. <laughs> Daddy, I, I have I have one other question. Did we ever figure out what the the recurring phrase "Are you evil?" is referring to, or from? Oh no, I didn't even think about it. I, didn't, I remember it was a lot in the beginning, and then it comes up one time here on seven ninety or nine seventy nine that just is in quotes. Are you evil? And that was one that like always stood out to me at the beginning, and I forgot about it, and then it popped up here, and I wasn't sure if there was if you knew what the like if there was a reference to like a song or a saying or a book or a play or a movie, but it's one of those. I don't know. It's probably a witness. I'll have to watch Witness again with Harrison oh, yeah. Ford. Totally. <laughs> totally gonna watch that. Um, don't ever say that to the, oh, Okay. okay. <laughs> but like, she told me don't ever say that. Not anything else to really say, but like, what's your overall? Do you think it's optimistic or pessimistic? And what's your overall takeaway of the the book as a whole? Now that we've completely finished and seen at least the trajectory as it as it. Don't ever say to watch that you're saying it. Um, it feels bittersweet, but maybe a little bit a little bit sweeter than bitter. Yeah. I, I don't know if optimism would be the right word, but I don't feel yeah. don't the, the, the kids are going to be all right. Don't yeah. Say that word again. Whether our whether our narrator is going to be all right or not, I don't know. But that's I don't think that's what matters. I think it's more about Stacy and huh? Because like she makes that mention of like had had Stacy not you know saved the day or had she just been if it had just been her and she got murdered there. She would have gone back to Frank, and then what would have happened if Stacy, if that happened? What what would Stacy's life be like if she grew up the rest of her, you know, teen years in that that environment? Yeah. Um, so, so I I think I think they're gonna be okay. Like, there's gonna be a fight. There's gonna be a struggle, but they're they're fierce. Um, they're strong, and they they can survive. You know, it's kind of yeah. like with the with the Cubs. Is that maybe like yeah? So the I, I it is interesting that the protagonist Daddy, I, I, not talking about their their sta status at the for the future at the end of the book. Like I feel like usually like a book will will gear itself to like making sure that you know the protagonist's future at least like yeah a sense of it. And in a case we kind of don't here like but that the maybe the the whole point is that her yeah that her letting go that she can't protect them all the time is really the the key for her future and then she doesn't yeah. well well again it might not be fair but to draw the parallel with the lioness in captivity now right yeah cage surrounded sanitized like these strange men coming in and imposing things on her life but she has her she has her kids yeah um, she's reunited with her family and maybe it's not the situation you want to be in but there's that love in her life Right, yeah, <laughs> it does kind of almost become one of those like, uh, like you can't change the, uh, all the evils in the world, but at least you can like enjoy your time at home and with your family sort of situations where, 
there's a lot to be concerned about. There's a lot in the world to be concerned about, but that you can't control all of it, but at least like you can be yeah. with your, your kids and, yeah. and enjoy them as you can. Yeah. So I like to say, is that optimistic? Good Lord, yeah. I don't know, but I mean, it's not hopeless. No, no, it's not, it's, it's not nihilistic at all either. Like, yeah. Like the sense of like, cause it would be very easy to fall into that. I think of like, well, everything's just fucked. Like the gut yeah. people, the, the environment, the like, is it? there is so, so related to this. Radiant Terminus. Let's go Radiant Terminus. Let's go Radiant Terminus. <laughs> Full on Radiant Terminus time. When I was in Sarnia, there's the, one of my, so my great, whatever it is, great, great, great grandfather would have been one of the people that moved there from England and they had all these huge amounts of farmland. Right. But now this place, mm -hmm. Sarnia is like pretty messy and part because like places like Dow chemical went there and like fucked up their river and just destroyed through chemicals and pouring them out and like radiate and like ruining the ground, ruining the soil, ruining everything and then abandoning. So they wouldn't have to clean it up. So they just left like all their shit and took off. And there's another company that was there that came in afterwards that did essentially the same thing. And like the prime piece of real estate for Sarnia, theoretically right off the highway, right by the bridge to the U S and all that is just vacant because it would cost billions of dollars to get, to clean up the soil and they wouldn't know what to do with it. And like to take care of all the asbestos problems, all this stuff. And it was like, it felt like this book where like, there's, this is a very good representation. The city is a representation of how commerce comes in and murders people and then just like runs away. Wait, and that's where you went on vacation? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> Intense, dude. Were you, were you there for a funeral? <laughs> like, why would you go there? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the one story from like my, cause I met one of my, my dad's cousin for lunch and he was okay. telling like the family history and he had like the whole <laughs> family book and like it was sort of not only is Sarnia kind of a very bleak place but um our family history is like real messy so like there was a the main guy came to Sarnia had nine children and then the one child that leads to like my family line had 11 children so there's like a million people <laughs> Oh, good lord! Yeah, it's like one of those family trees that's like an explosion of nonsense. Like, and it's it's yeah. complete. It stopped in 1983. So there's like nothing for it. But but then all the stories that are in this book of like our family are like all stories of like of of failure. Like it was really like it was <laughs> it was very intense. It would be like this one guy. What I think it was from my family part of the tree went off to like Utah to start a farm and then everything caught on fire. And so you had to move back with no money. <laughs> and then, like, well, that was like your, that was like your Mormon uncle, whatever he had it coming. <laughs> but wore your magic yeah. underwear, uncle Josiah. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> Josiah post and his 11 John wives. And William. Yeah. Every one of them is John and William, like all the way down. And oh, it's yeah. like, and they don't even name them like two or three. They're just like John. John William. Those are like pasty white names. Those are really good, <laughs> good family names. Cambridge. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is all bleak. Yeah. I don't know. Reading this book and then having that conversation was really impactful to me because I just felt like it was a little bit like, oh shit. Like at least I can go back and take care of my yeah. kids, like hang out with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is really yeah. bad. Like, there's no way that this city should really even exist anymore. There's there's no young people here. It's like it's it was tough. It was tough. Good times, good old Canada. <laughs> All right. Anyways, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to say about this thing? Do we have a favorite line from the section? Um. Yeah. Mine was in page uh, nine twenty six, right towards the beginning. Um. Was that part of the section? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Okay. Um, just towards the, the end there, it's, there's kind of like this beautiful breakdown where everything that she's been ranting about for, you know, 900 pages is just all of a sudden stupid. It's all stupid, right? All these, you're right. I'm sorry. My daughter doesn't like me saying that word. Um, but, so, uh, sorry, I'm going to say stupid a couple of times, Isaac, but I'm reading the book. My stupid attempts at accounting, stupid self-absorption, stupid mu mucus, stupid itch, stupid rash, 
brush, mush, stupid guy in a guy, my stupid dreams, my stupid smile. The fact that I dreamt Chuck was still beautiful and his deep red hair had only mildly faded and his body was still, um, was still on offer to me. But that's stupid too because he won't be dreaming of me because that would be stupid. The fact that there is no place for me in this world, no place. The fact that I am broken, broken. The fact that there's no room in the whole of Ohio for my needs, my desires, my dilemmas, my tragedies, my flat tires, my mommy, mommy. The fact that I want my mommy. Yeah, that's really intense. I, I like that quite a bit too. Um, man, I'm trying to find like one that, yeah. I don't know, man. There's a lot of lines in here, but the one that the one that stood out to me is like being the most intense. It's not like a funny one or like necessarily my favorite one, but one that like really ran out or stood out at me was when um, after the event, when they're like for a while, the fact that at first Ben claimed he didn't need a therapist, but then out of the blue one day, he said he didn't want to live and edit. I'm dead inside. Oh Which dear. Seemed very intense and like, it, that that brought home to me like the the situation that as you were saying it earlier it was like described in a way that's sort of flat and like almost humorous or like not not like dramatic but then you have the yeah. trauma and the trauma like is mm -hmm. very real and it and it seems to be almost it's not really a commentary on but it could be almost a comment right as a commentary on the violence that is glorified in like or even like news stories are like you know they don't really talk about the the post impact trauma it's much more of like the event itself and how did that play out and like but like these, these people will be messed up for years because that would be i can can you even imagine how crazy that would be to be have someone with like a semi-automatic in your kitchen like shooting parts of your house <laughs> like that yeah would, that would be mess you up forever so like i think that they're part of this like the her whole thing of being broken that runs throughout it and like all the different ways that like the world attacks you and like leaves you with like these mm -hmm. various scars or these various problems where she doesn't remember certain things and like is always frazzled like that sense of like a, a weird sort of like overall trauma really stands out to me now looking back at it in, in retrospect yeah i don't know i agree so Wait, how do you i think a fun wrap up like how how would you because i've like hand sold this book to a few people just like when I, hey, what are you reading? What's the next book I should get? And I mentioned reading this one. How would you, how do you, how, how would you sell this book to somebody? That is tough. I think I, I would. I mean, I assume you'd recommend you'd recommend it to somebody. You should read. You should read, read Lucy Allman, read Ducks to Newberry Poor. What would you say? Yeah, I, I've recommended it as being like a book that's very easy to like with the like the the best voice of like someone who's just telling you something for a long time and telling you about life mm -hmm. and about their life and doing it in a way that's like entertaining and informative and like dramatic, but that listening to their, that voice is perfect. It's like sitting with, not like at a bar with someone, but kind of like at a bar with someone who's just like, here's everything that's on my mind. And like being able to get that sense of a, a closeness to like a character and to be immersed in a world that like this, that is very much our world today. Like there's nothing unrecognizable about this. It's not like reading, Ulysses where you're like, I don't get this. Like, I don't know what this reference yeah. could possibly be. Like the references in here, you know, or you could Google them if you really don't. Yeah. Um, Why but, so many bodily fluids? I don't understand this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like that being able to be immersed in a world that you recognize the voice that is so confident and so like compelling and telling you things that is like, that you relate to and that you find funny and that you can sort of hone in on it, I think is like kind of a, one of the best experiences of reading a book. Like it's, 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 it's almost in a way, this is not how I would sell it in the end because I'd have to be, you know, much quicker about it. But thinking about it now too, like if a normal book is telling you a lot of things and, and I don't, a normal book sounds dumb. I don't know what I'm trying to say. The, um, like I'm reading another book for class right now. And it's a book that's a normal conventionally structured narrative in which there's a character who's sort of telling you about their world and explaining things, but not in this way. This book draws you so close to the consciousness of this woman that I, that is the most impressive thing and that I've seen in a long time to be this close to like understanding how this mind's working rather than feeling like it's overly crafted. Like this book is clearly crafted and very well put together. But as you read it, the sense isn't like you're being manipulated. And I, I always like 
very allergic to books that make me feel like I'm being manipulated. Like the author's trying to sure. put things in a place that they can pay off later, or like they're trying to make yeah. you feel sad for someone when it's just like, it feels like they're trying. And this book doesn't feel like it tries. There's a sense of ease to it that like is really com like a compelling, amazing thing. And I think if I told anyone, to, if I were selling this hands on this, I'd be like, why don't you just sit down in the store, read 15 pages, and then let me know if you want to buy the book or not. Yeah, there you go. 15 pages, you're going to like the whole thing. That It does not. Yeah. It is that pro propel propulsive and like and engaging throughout. So if you like any part of this, get get the book because you will be rewarded. Read it over a year if you need to. Read it over a week if you get sucked in. It doesn't matter. Like it's, You're going to always go back and just read bits of this. And like you keep seeing some of the same things and you'll be able to fall into this voice. And this voice and this narrative like uh, uh, viewpoint on the world is really important and and illuminating and really strong. I think that, that, that that's, how, that's what that's what I like about it. And that's why I would try and try and emphasize and that in a shorter way to like a simple reader. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, Dan, I agree. And sell it. Um, I've been telling people just about how amazing the voice is. Um, I mean, you could you could talk about like obviously the the form that the book takes and how well it works with that. But yeah. I think after reading all of it, um, I would just sell it as it's, it's this wonderful empathetic case of um, why it's time for the patriarchy to end. Yeah. Oh yeah. Check it out. See what you think. It's a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful case that's laid out in this extremely empathetic, amazing way. Yep. Um, yeah. It's long and exhaustive, but if you want to talk about, why the power structures we have in place aren't working. It needs to be long and exhaustive. And I, I think this is a wonderful, um, yeah. kind of like a wonderful, almost like a thesis as to why why it needs to take place. Read it and see what you think at the end. And also that like the opposite form of this being like a short pamphlet that's like more of a diatribe or like a specific, the fact that works so well in contrast to this. Like if you imagine this mm -hmm. pamphlet that's like the fact that men have ruined everything, the fact that Dow Chemical fucked up Sarnia, the fact that like there's all these things that are killing us, the fact that all these guns are out there. Like you can make this a very short summarized mm -hmm. pamphlet about, the, about why the systems mm -hmm. don't work and it would be not good. It would probably be- you'd crumple it up and you'd crumple it up and throw it away. Like don't, don't, yeah. preach, don't preach to me about this. I don't want to hear it. But yeah, reading this, you, you like again, you carry it with you. You don't like like I said earlier. Like um, I'm like filtering everything I'm seeing and through this narrator's like, oh, what would our narrator think about this or say about this? And you become very empathetic to what she's going through and how she sees the future. Yeah, yeah. If you're a parent, that's a that's a, really that's good a very you. powerful thing, and that's what good literature should do. And this one does wonderfully. So. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so buy it, read it if you haven't already. If you've been reading <laughs> listening to this podcast, I hope you enjoyed it. Our 10th season. We will be back. We're gonna take a little bit of a break here um, to get a lot of stuff done this month. But uh, next month, we'll announce it soon, but next month the, uh, the next book that we're gonna do for season 11 is The Dreamed Part, which is the second part of Rodrigo Ferdinand part trilogy. I don't know what we want to call it. There is a term that they've been using, but I forget what it is right now. But uh, that will be fun because we've done the invented okay. part. Yeah. You go back and listen to the invented part or read it or yeah. I'll refresh everyone's memory about it before we start. <clears throat> but the dream part is picking up some of the storylines from there, telling it, telling everything in a very different way. The structure is different. There's still three parts. There's still like certain aspects to it that are that are the same and there's certain recognizable characters obviously but there are there is a different approach that's going on and a different sort of of way of thinking about literature and it does have the kind of i know that when the book came out in france they compared him to like david lynch's inland empire as being like this that this was Frazan's like statement about art and his whole art and his whole life and his whole ideas about it and you do get that sense reading the dream part that it is a different take on how the invented part was very structured and very concrete. The dream part's going to be a little bit more dreamier. Uh, but it will be fun. And I think that we'll have a lot of, a lot of good times talking about that in the next season. So, and it's, well, it's great, fun. great it's job. Fun. Great job shoehorning David Lynch into a talk that has nothing to do with David Lynch. Wonderful job, Chad. I'm surprised you didn't put baseball analytics <laughs> crap in there as well. Baseball, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, yep. Yep.
Yep. You ruined our last episode. You ruined our last episode by being you. You're just like your family. You're so just cool. like you're just like your ancestors. Go out into the world and then shit back to Sarnia. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>